Welcome all to this uh, session, uh, this after lunch session. <laughs> uh, my name is Victor Garcia. I'm part of the Android team, the mobile team. Uh, he's Jose Garcia in the Android team as well. Huh? We are not family, but uh, Garcia is a, uh, quite a common surname, last name in Spain. Right? <laughs> But yeah, that's yeah, pretty much all. <laughs> okay. Um, so welcome to this session about uh, it's called beyond connectivity because it's, we are main, we are going to talk. Well, we are not going to talk so much actually. This is more about use cases and how to address uh, the offline challenge in in many projects. So, as I said, this is about use case. We are going to have four. Uh, use cases uh, with a, a presentation for each one and then some time for questions and, and answers. And as you will see, uh, the offline challenge is a very complex topic and we will see different kind of solutions because when we think of offline, it's not always the same solution. Maybe it's just providing a all point of care in offline mode or an application has we do in the mobile team. So we'll, you will see different approaches. Uh, well, in case any of you needs the French translation, it is available available in Zoom, but you have to log in in Zoom and using your uh, earplug, you will hear the, the French translation, okay? Okay, I see more people coming in, welcome. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to wait a little bit. Okay, you can come down here if you want. Don't be, don't be shy. There are a lot of plenty of spaces here. No? Yeah. Yeah. It's... So, as I said, uh, this session, uh, we are here just to present uh, the use cases. So, we're going to start with the first use case. Uh, it is, uh, the presenter is uh, Mikhailo Siusko from the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. Um, yeah, he's going to present the its use case in Ukraine. So can you hear us? Uh, I think, yeah. I hear you, I hear you. Yeah, we can hear you as well. Um, so please, uh, can you share the slides right now? Yeah, sure. Okay, it's coming. All right. So, yeah, I can see your presentation. So the floor is yours. Go ahead. Mm. Okay. Uh, you see my presentation, yeah? Yeah, we do. Okay, excellent. Uh, my name is Mikhailo. I am a project manager in the Ukrainian Red Cross Society and also one of the DHIS-2 implementers in Ukraine. And I'm going to tell you about how DHIS-2 helps us uh, to enhance uh, emergency response in Ukraine. Uh, following the 2022 escalation of armed conflict, uh, Ukraine uh, faced severe socioeconomic challenges, including uh, healthcare accessibility issues for both locals and internally displaced persons. That's why to address uh, this, uh, the Ukrainian Red Cross initiated mobile health units, MHU projects in over 20 regions across all over the Ukraine with the support of uh, movement partners. MHUs uh, comprising doctors, nurses and drivers play a pivotal role in delivering primary health care health care amidst uh, wartime and humanitarian crises. In October 2022, 
the Norwegian Red Cross uh, introduced DHIS to Internopil and uh, Khmelnytsky to digitize MHU operations, demonstrating the tool's effectiveness in individual clinical case management and data anal analysis reporting. Consequently, URCS extended DHIS to adoption across all Ukrainian regions, establishing its uh, as uh, primary CRM system. CRM system to accompany this expansion, we did a lot of training materials, user guides, and uh, cascaded training sessions. Let's uh, talk about case statistics of DHIS. Uh, usage in your CS. Since pilot launch in October 2022, the DHIS spread to 22 Ukrainian regions for primary health care program. So currently it is used by over 120 MHUs with, with, with over 55 with over 500 K events registered. Our rehabilitation department has three regions using DHIS2 now, but uh, seven more are planned to be uh, linked to their program till uh, the end of the year. The same with home-based care. Currently, DHIS2 is functioning only in one pilot region. Uh, right now, we are gathering feedback uh, from the teams to prepare the home-based uh, care instance for scale-up process. That's why uh, numbers, the numbers for rehabilitation uh, and home-based care, as you can see from this slide, are not so impressive as they are for, as they are for primary health care. But as I said, it's only beginning. The rapid scale-up uh, of the DHIS2 implementation can be attributed to several key factors. First of all, your URCS Digital uh, Transformation Unit hired dedicated staff to be part of the core uh, transformation uh, team for the scale up and on ongoing support of DHIS2. Moreover, close uh, collaboration and mentoring support was uh, fostered between the core team members and the Norwegian Red Cross partner. Also, it should be noted that uh, technically the simplicity of DHIS2 point users, of course, the flexibility of its configuration for administration, the offline capability of the Android app have all been essential to the platform's rapid adoption. Talking about uh, the Android app, uh, let's analyze its main pros and cons. As you can see from the slide, the main pros are the following. First of all, it's simplicity. As I said previously, the user interface is user-friendly. Usually it takes quite a short time to teach and users to use it. Uh, GPS, yeah, we also use uh, GPS functionality of the Android app uh, to get uh, and store uh, this uh, data. It helps us to make uh, coverage maps uh, so our partners can see the places where we uh, provide services. Signature, a very useful feature for some of our directions which need uh, uh, it to validate the visit from uh, the beneficiary side, of course. Uh, budget friendly, DHS2 Android app is completely free. It's very good. Also, it doesn't require expensive devices to be used because even low budget Android phones can handle it. For instance, each of our HBC region has about 80 social workers. Most of them can effectively use, this, use the DHIS2 tracking program directly on their personal devices. So we don't have to buy the devices uh, to provide uh, the devices for our uh, staff. Offline capability is also very, very important for us because to reach the most vulnerable people, our teams usually work at faraway locations without stable internet connection. Also, nowadays, as you have heard, Ukraine suffers with often electricity blackouts, which brings the internet related issues on a high level. Even in the big cities, it's a big problem. 
That's why Android app uh, is so important for us. But uh, despite all uh, pros, of course, uh, uh, we have faced uh, and a little bit cons. First of all, no iPhone support. Yeah, about eight, about uh, fifteen percent of our end users have iPhone, so they cannot use their personal devices for collecting data in the app. Yeah, it's a pity a little bit. Incomplete localization. Uh, yeah, the second issue with Android app is uh, incomplete localization because uh, uh, Android app uh, localization for Ukrainian language is not finished yet. That uh, causes some inconveniences for our end users, especially uh, for those who are who, who don't who who, who uh, doesn't speak English. And the last uh, main uh, issue, main con, sync issues. Sync uh, since uh, the launch uh, in October 2022, we have faced a lot of sync errors. For uh, but uh, most of them are connected to non-unique uh, program attribute. For example, in our instances, we use a special approach to code beneficiaries, depending on their surname, name, patronymic, and date of birth. This code must be unique in order to exclude duplicates. The sync error occurs when uh, an end user is trying to enroll somebody that has already been enrolled in the system but the local database of the device hasn't been synchronized yet with the server database and doesn't, uh, and uh, th that's why the end user uh, cannot find uh, the beneficiary. In this case, end user will enroll this uh, beneficiary as unique, but when the internet connection is finally established and the uh, user uh, try and and user tries to synchronize such beneficiary he gets uh, error uh, non unique uh, program attribute okay uh -huh. also i want to tell you a few words about local ownership and data migration process uh, in response to uh, the need to, to align with national leg legislation and to achieve uh, greater autonomy in making system modifications, the, RC the RCS has made uh, the, the strategic uh, decision to uh, assume local ownership of its uh, net national DHIS2 instance, requiring the migration of the database to its own servers. The data migration process was handled by uh, Bauer system and it was successful. So now we are free to make any changes uh, which uh, to fit uh, our needs uh, in most uh, extent. Okay. Uh, on this slide, you can see our plans on uh, 2024 and 2025. First of all, uh, primary healthcare, we are going to increase uh, DHS2 analytic usage for better evidence-based decision-making. Uh, in to uh, do this, we are currently uh, working with teams to uh, provide the reports and visualizations to fit their analytics needs more effectively. We want to develop our current analytic uh, approach. Uh, Home-based care. As you can see from the slide, uh, we are going to implement DHIS-2 in all Ukrainian regions till the end of 2025. The same situation is uh, for rehabilitation. Okay, summarizing all above said, I can assure you that uh, despite all challenges, URCS uh, remains committed to DHIS-2 development in Ukraine. Future endeavors include uh, extending uh, the system for rehabilitation and the uh, home-based care programs till the end of 2025. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I am, you're welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very nice and clear presentation. So now we have like a, yeah. Five, five minutes, something like that, a few minutes. In case you have any question you want to do. Uh, yeah, there is a question. Yeah. 
Uh, there is a question, Kylo. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Ethiopia. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tefos from Ethiopia. I want to raise one question. My question is, mm -hmm. uh, from your uh, experience, how how do you uh, enforce private institutes uh, to adapt uh, the HIS2? What how, is your experience? Yeah. How do you enforce? Could I I I didn't hear you. Good. Uh, can you repeat, please? How how, how you enforce private institutions to adapt the HIS2 uh, in a country? Just for scale up of the HIS2. You mean? Uh, uh let me uh, clarify please uh, you mean how we uh, enforce uh, the dhas in our regions without uh, national private institution yeah he, he said a uh, private institutions private ins you... institutions yeah that's the question have to enforce private institutions to use dhs2 we don't enforce it we uh, currently use uh, uh, DHIS2 only within URCS. Okay, only within URCS. Yeah, we don't use uh, DHIS. I'm not aware of uh, usage uh, DHIS2 outside uh, URCS in private institution. Okay. Yeah, th thank you so much for the nice presentation. I really I, I appreciate the presentation so much and and uh, it has answered some of the questions that I, I was trying to ask. But one question remains outstanding. Uh, the question is about the GPS geo-coordinate position. So, you know, we tried mm -hmm. uh, the the distribution of the LLIN is kind of a mass campaign in the community, the way you, you have been doing outreaches for health services. And when you capture the geo coordinate, sometimes it it falls outside the the region. So, like most of our coordinates fall in uh, some are in the ocean, others are in uh, North America, others are in Europe, while you're in Africa and South Sudan. So, uh, how uh, from your experience, how did it work with you the issue of GPS in the DHIS two system? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, the usage of DPS uh, functionality is very simple. Within URCS, uh, we use it only within a home uh, based care uh, program and uh, primary health care program. Uh, the usage is uh, following. Let me describe. Our team uh, goes to the location, yeah, and then uh, opens uh, the app and uh, starts to uh, register the visit and during the registering the visit uh, the uh, team uh, choose the field with coordinate type data type value type and uh, that's it uh, the coordinates uh, uh, we receive coordinates on the device and uh, we use it only within ukraine and it helped us to prepare different uh, maps uh, for our uh, movement partners. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have at least two more questions. Okay, third, three questions. I think four. Okay, maybe because we have to move on to the. We have four use cases in total, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe we can. Yeah, this two do the, two questions and move for the next one. And maybe at the end, if we have some time, we can sum up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It sounds that the rollout of the HS2 went quite smoothly over a short period of time. Congratulations. I'm interested to know uh, who does data entry in mm -hmm. uh, URCS? Is it done by medical professionals who are also pr uh, providing services, or do you have additional data entry staff? If it is done by medical professionals, how did you address the workload concerns? Um, over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. 
yeah, uh, mostly uh, the data entry is uh, done by our clinicians, mostly. But uh, for some programs, for some directions, such as home-based care, the registration, the initial enrollment of the beneficiary is uh, performed by uh, coordinators of the region. Because in the in case of home based care, we need to uh, agreement to make agreement with beneficiary, and it's a lot of bureaucracy, and that's why uh, the initial enrollment for uh, their beneficiaries is made by the coordinators of the regions. But yeah, most of our data are entered by uh, clinicians. Uh, we. Uh, right now we have about. Uh, 200 and users and uh, we uh, didn't face uh, a lot of uh, server we, we didn't face in any implication with uh, payloads yet okay thank you maybe maybe this part of the question you should clarify for me uh, and ask again and I will answer again Yeah, I'm here now. <laughs> well, maybe I don't know how much time we have left. Um, I, think, I think this is the last question. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. The second part of the question was about workload. A workload, okay. Because yeah. medical professionals have a lot of work. Do you have any performance incentive, for example, to encourage them to do DHS to data entry? Or yeah, how yeah, do yeah. you encourage? <laughs> yeah, understood. Uh, yeah, we estimated the approximate workload uh, for each uh, registration, and it depends. And we uh, tried to develop our uh, forms as simple as possible. Uh, and uh, for example, for MHU, the average workload per one beneficiary is uh, uh, one hundred and a half one. one one minute and a half, yeah, and ninety seconds average per load for one for per one beneficiary. Uh, also, uh, we uh, try uh, we are trying to remo remove all unnecessary paperwork. Uh, before uh, uh, implementation of DHAS two, they used to do a lot of paperwork, a lot of Excel work, a lot of calculation. Uh, in when they. Uh, we're uh, going to prepare some monthly uh, quarterly uh, report. You understand? And uh, now, uh, yeah, they uh, spent uh, some time for registration. They, they, in some extent, their workload uh, were uh, was increased. Uh, but uh, from other hand, they uh, understand that uh, this also. Uh, uh, help uh, help them to reduce uh, some uh, uh, some work, uh, some time uh, because they uh, don't have to do a lot of uh, paperwork uh, they usually used to do uh, late, uh, later before implementation. I wanted to to make a short comment. So I think, but comments keep adding up in my head. So I want to make three very short comments. Mm -hmm. One is that was a very good point. Normally, the incentives of doing and mobile or digital data collection is not having to do all the manual tallying and everything after while you are also running services. So normally that pays off. Um, to the coordinates, mature. I wanted to say we there are in the Android app. Sometimes there are issues on accuracy, but that is like we and we are working on that for the next version. Mm -hmm. It's particularly important for household things because household distributions or household campaigns because you need very good accuracy. So we are going to work on giving information to the user on the accuracy level because that's not the Android app, it's the GPS services and the device, but we can help the user know when accuracy is good enough. But if they are in the middle of the ocean, that looks more like a tapping thing. <laughs> And, and Mukailo, thank you very much for your presentation. This is Marta Villa. We have been exchanging e emails. Yeah, yeah. We are very happy to, to, to learn about your project, and we are sorry you couldn't join. I want to mention on two of your cons, you had a big one, which is iPhone. 
I'm afraid we cannot respond to that in the short term. We have another one on localization. So I wanted to take advantage of all this audience here. If you need to translate the app, drop a message in the COP because we don't translate the app. You translate the app. We don't know all the languages. So if mm -hmm. you drop a message, hey, I need the app in Ukrainian, then it's about <laughs> coordinating. Really, Understood. it's about coordinating and making sure it's ready for the next version because it has to be integrated before we release. Where so please don't I hesitate. Do we, are, we have the contact, so I will actually connect you directly, Mikhailo, for Ukrainian, but I wanted to take advantage of the audience. Just drop okay. a message in the COP. We will okay. take it from there. Thank you. Over. Okay, thank you very much, Mikhailo. Uh, just for you to know, there are like three or four questions remaining to be <laughs> answered. So uh, hopefully we have time at the end. Maybe we can address them. But uh, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, so, so the next use case is uh, yes. Please come here. Come here. It's a uh, Matur Dam. It's going to present from the Ministry of Health of South Sudan, right? So you yeah. have. Okay, so it's uh, Matur Den Tien from the Ministry of Health of South Sudan presenting the distribution of LLIN in South Sudan. So, yeah, please come here to just uh, pass the slides if you want. Uh, so, please, just yes, like uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, because the time is running up. I hope you, I'm, I'm loud. Yeah, thank you so much. Greeting from South Sudan and the frontliners of the DHIS2 users. Uh, um, that's my name. I'm Matur Temtiang from Minister of Health. I'm uh, uh, the head of health information system and biostatistics. And I was the chief manager for the LLI distribution in the country. Uh, we started the distribution in uh, in uh, 2022 December, and uh, the digitalization came as a requirement for the for the distribution. It was actually a big shock to us. So the donors required the distribution to be done digitally, and we never had such thing in the past. So we try our best to to have a couple of things that we. Uh, I need a system. Can can you enable it? Slideshow. Okay, uh, thank you so much. That's that's actually the map of my country, the map of South Sudan. And uh, you have seen uh, the keys, the green. The other, I'm not good in colors anyway. But you can see the green is where there were more nets distributed in that region. And uh, it's good that I have the witness from South Sudan. I, I, I saw someone who was introducing herself yes it's there she she had been in south sudan and she knows all these uh, uh geographical locations uh we have distributed uh, uh so many nets you could see uh the digital uh, the the dhis2 was used as a platform to distribute the nets in the country and uh the fire thing started in in december 2022 and the actual distribution is kicks off in January 2023 until the end of, of, uh, of 2024. So before we develop the tools, we have a couple of things like checking the whole system to see the, the competence of the, to, of the system to capture all data coming from the, 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 the community uh, level and to avoid some 
uh, you know, shock at, 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 at the middle of the distribution. So we had his Tanzania supporting us. They did system diagnostic and, and they figured out what need to be done before the data was actually uh, synchronized. So we, we had distributed uh, around six, eight million, I think that's benefiting around 15 million people. And South Sudan is a, it's a very large country with very small population. Yeah. So these were some of the steps that we, that we undertook to make sure that the distribution went on smoothly. We created a layer called the master trainers, mostly comprised of those that are at national level, the expertise with the background in, in data management, IT background and all this. So we train them to be now the one to train the state level. So we have uh, other technical team that was trained at the state level. And we also had the, the basic training for the supervisors and the registrars. So this training, uh, layers of training helps us really to, to achieve what we want. So the last level is actually a level comprised of the community members. Some of them have never had opportunity even to see the latest uh, mobile phones. You know, some do not have smartphones, some do not know how to use gadgets and all this. So it was really a big, a big issue for us to make sure that they are trained first on how to use the mobile phone and later on train on how to use the DHIS too. Uh, so the system was designed and customized to fit the needs of the LLI distribution in South Sudan. And the training was actually to equip the users with, uh, you know, features of data quality, data screening, and, and all this. So some of the program rules were actually activated in the system to, to start screening outliers and some data, uh, data that have problems. And uh, the GPS was actually incorporated because it's one of the requirements from from the donor that they, at the end of the distribution, they will sample 5% of the total household that have received the net, and therefore they need the geo-coordinate of this location. So the, the functionality of, of GPS was activated to capture the GPS of, of the household that have received, and uh, we got uh, some issues. You know, some of the, uh, you know, location were actually falling out Inside the borders of South Sudan, you could see some are in the United States of America, others are in some part of Africa, some fall in China, others in Europe and all this. So it was a big thing. So I had an opportunity to meet uh, Scott in, in, uh, in, in Cape Town and I raised these things to him, but he said it wasn't uh, a problem of South Sudan, but this is still what we are working on. The, the position is still not that accurate in the system, but the next version will, will, will make it well. And uh, we customized thing and as, as distribution was continuing, we developed some dashboard to actually uh, reflect the, the, the nets that are being distributed on a daily basis. This was actually the, the first batch of the training that we, we, we conducted in, in town to train the system support and uh, the, the master trainers. So the system support was actually a, a, another layer that was instituted to make sure that the data synchronization happened at the center. So these community members were unable to sync the, the, the collected data. So we, we have to train a couple of colleagues who have background in IT to move around the country to synchronize the data into the DHIS2 and they could also check whether all fields are Fill or the form is correctly filled and, and, and the GPS is, is, is well captured. So that was one of the things. And uh, this is just a dashboard. You can see uh, the dashboard was customized to, to check on the total number of nets distributed, the total number of people that have benefited from the, from the nets, the, 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 the males, the females, the pregnant mothers, and the under five. So a total of around 15 million people benefited. And you could see the dashboard is actually on regions. We have 10 administrative regions. I mean, 13 administrative regions and three major, major, major regions. So this dashboard actually 
is is currently live in the DHS too. If you have user uh, credentials, you will be able to see all all these things. And uh, you can see this this is where we were, and uh, it was very difficult to reach, you know, uh, countryside. And uh, the distribution was actually happening during the rainy season. It was really a big thing. The good thing, the tablets that we we use for the distributions were having, uh, where I know the cases were bought. They were inside the cases to avoid, you know, being, you know, like it, when it fell down or so maybe it rains found you on the way has coming back from the field, the, 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 the water can't get in. So they were well protected and, and, and it was, you know, a big achievement for the procurement team. They thought of that, you know, South Sudan is, is, is totally different and it is very difficult to implement the community intervention during the rainy season. And uh, you could see, this is some of our system support team. Uh, my colleague uh, Tuzo is there. We have Wilfred somewhere here. And uh, this, this were actually the, the DHIS2 system support that were actually doing synchronization of the data into the DHIS2. Uh, to this, I've come to the end of the presentation and I uh, thank you so much. So uh, I'm okay. ready to take yeah. on some your thank questions. You. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. So, okay, we have already two questions, three, Question, four questions, okay. <laughs> um, I think that's so. <laughs> Let's try to address these four questions very quickly. Um, and you have to be, to be very, very much, Matthew, for your to raise your hand. sharing your experience with us. Um, I have a quick one. You know, the whole thing here we are looking at uh, using DHIS2 beyond connectivity, that is, if there's no internet connection, then how can yes. we leverage on the offline um, properties? So my question, you already had mentioned that some of your field guys were not able to sync the data, and so you had to push guys uh, with IT knowledge to support them. But my question is, uh, were they not able to sync because of internet issues or maybe lack of the scale? If it was because of internet issues, then how were the guys who went to the field then syncing it? Did they you know, collect the tablet and then come to sync somewhere there is internet connectivity, you know, how was that approach carried out? Because it's uh, really important to, you know. So, thank you. Yeah, th thank you so much. You know, there was both the, the issue of uh, the skills of those that are recording the data and the issue of the the the, the, the data, the internet. You know, we, the, system, the tool was actually offline. We're collecting data offline and we put a cap on, 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 on the tablets, each tablets up to 200 household for the areas that do not have connectivity. So they have to collect up to 200 household, all right, offline, and later on move to where these guys are, these uh, system support with, with strong internet connectivity to start pushing the, 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 the data into the server. So some were doing it, but at some point we, 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 we found it difficult for for, for other part of the region, you know, to do it from there. So we create that layer to ensure the data quality issue. One of the biggest things was like, uh, there was some validation rule that were not working well in the, in the Android app. You see, uh, like, according to the WHO guideline is one net for 1.8 persons, all right? So we said, we customize that and we say, if you, if, if logically can be one net for two people, you say when you have one person in the household, you give one net. If you get two people, give one. If you get three, give two. If you get four, give two, five, like that. That's validation rule was there. Like if you say five male, two female, that's already six. So the totals of the net to be given will automatically sum up down. So that was a little bit technical for those who do not understand it well. As I said before, we're dealing with people that have never used, you know, the, the digital tools, or some of them were even struggling to know what is this, whether it's a smartphone or whether it's a tablet and all this. But because of the administrative layers that we created, helped us a lot to, to move efficiently and effectively. 
I think that that's 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 what the reason. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Let, wait for the next answer. Thank yeah, you very yeah. thank you very much for your presentation. I had a similar question, just along the the lines of volumes. And so just how many device devices did you deploy across your community health workers? On average, how many registrations were being kept on each device? I know you mentioned you were trying to sync after every 200, but how many registrations were you accumulating per device? And did you run into any performance related challenges just due to like volumes? And what was your device management strategy across the suite of, of tablets or mobile devices? All right, actually, uh, we have we had around 6,000 tablets, 6,000 devices. And, uh, you know, because of some logistic challenges, those 6,000 were not active at the same time. So we, we said, let two regions start the distribution, and the other region now start the training. When the distribution ends, the other two regions, we activate the other two regions that were actually doing the distribution. So probably we had around around 2,000, 3,000 tablets active at the same time. And uh, the data synchronization mostly happened uh, in the night from from seven onward, because we, we normally collect the, the, the tools from afternoon up to six. From seven onward, we sit down, we activate. So we have a mobile telecommunication called MTN. So MTN uh, had other subscription called Zolkavir. Zolkavir in, in, in Arabic is a big fashion. So Zolkavir is a very nice subscription. It gives you five hours, one GB, and uh, you use that one to synchronize the data at night. And it is more you know, uh, faster at night than than, than the day in, in those peripheries. So we, we, we took advantage of Zolkabir to help us synchronize our, our data at night. So uh, the other secondary thing that this tool helped us, which was not part of our thinking, was to act as an audit tool. You know, when we did the distribution in 2017 in the country, a lot of net were lost. You know, that was manual distribution. But when we use DHIS2, DHIS2 help us to track the nets that have been issued out, the net that have been distributed, and the nets that are still in the store. So if 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 the airlines are not with the household, they have not been reflected in the system, and they are not in the warehouse. All right. Definitely they are with the registrar. So we definitely call registrar and said, okay, you are given this number of nets. You have distributed these, and they are now reflecting the system. These number of nets are missing. Where are they? So that that was actually a, a very very uh, you know good one, and it was it was a secondary one. It wasn't the primary reason of activating the digital tool, but it, we later on found very easy for us to do the auditing and do the accountability. We need to move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I don't know, we have yeah. time for one more comment. So, yeah, we have three more questions, but uh, they will be around also in the coffee break, so we can yeah uh, reach them. And there is also a question in Zoom as well. Uh, we will try to address it in the chat. Do so, you do want to say something? Yeah, okay. I wanted to say something. No, yeah. no, he's the next presenter as well. So can, can yeah. you do so? You want to say something to the before Just to close the and you start the next one. Yeah, add, you want to add something? You want like to we... say? Okay, but... but the microphone, yeah. Yeah, uh, one of the challenges that we uh, once faced uh, during the synchronization is that, um, uh, you know, we had uh, a limit in terms of uh, how many uh, uh, record that should be synced at a time. So we found that, uh, uh, and we trained uh, the volunteers that once you have done the co uh, collecting or maybe distributing this kind of uh, uh, this um, uh, this kind of record, then you need to sync before going again for the distribution, uh, because uh, you could find that uh, the reserved value is now uh, not there, and uh, then when he tried to capture more data, he will get more issues. So that was the challenge that uh, we once faced. So. Uh, we train them that uh, uh, with these records that you have to take, 
before going for the next phase of distribution, you have to sync and then make sure that uh, the, the, then the, the device can have another uh, value uh, being downloaded so for the next round of distribution, yeah. Uh, th thank you. Okay, to, thank actually, you. Uh, I think I like we need to move on to the end. Sorry. It's like we and I, in front of you, is the one who was actually buying the policies. It was my boss. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he's now in another uh, directorate. So he was the one who pushed for the LLIN to be done using the DHS too. So okay. The thank you very much. to use a different one. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the third one. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have. To... Yeah, sure. So the next presentation is in charge of Tuso, Tuso for, from his Tanzania to present the use case in Eritrea. So, okay, thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you heard ahead, uh, my name is uh, Tuzo Engelbert, uh, working under uh, HISP Tanzania as an uh, information uh, system advisor. Yeah, uh, one of our roles is to support uh, the Minister of Health, uh, Eritrea. Uh, Eritrea has a, a different uh, use case. As uh, we all know that uh, they have been going through a couple of uh, conflict with other uh, countries, so they decided to shut down the uh, the internet. So they are totally offline. Uh, but um, uh, they eager to have the data; uh, uh, it is still there, and they have to adopt one of these uh, offline modes, uh, where the setup is a bit complicated. So uh, uh, during our support uh, to the Minister of Health. Uh, we have uh, to involve in the local installation. So the, the, the setup that we are using over there uh, that um, uh, we have uh, the central uh, national database, uh, which is located uh, in the Ministry of Health. And then uh, we have uh, different levels. Uh, we have Zoba, and then we have uh, Zoba. It's like a, a region in the other countries. And then you have Zoba, sub-Zoba, uh, which can be described as the district in some other uh, other countries. So uh, the way how we have been doing it is that um, uh, first uh, we had to train uh, the national uh, the national staff that had the background of uh, ICT and even other regional ICT to make sure that uh, they know how to do uh, DHS2 installation in their uh, in their offices. The way how it is being uh, set up is that uh, you can find maybe, for example, for uh, malaria, like malaria program, uh, maybe located in a certain uh, office, they have a local area network. So they have a desktop, uh, which is actually being funded uh, with this donor, like Global Fund and, the, and other like UNICEF. And then you have to have a, a local installation of the DHS too. And within that uh, uh, local area network, so they have the IP that they have to access. So each one can still be able to access that uh, desktop using the IP uh, IP address. So that is the setup that uh, when we started supporting there, that is the setup that we, uh, we found they are using it. So the same setup uh, was it's also being used to the national uh, data, uh, 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 national uh, Ministry of Health, where they have a, a central database. They have a, a, a physical server, a, the big physical server, and then I have to make uh, an installation of the DHS2. And then after that, you have to pay in. Uh, the national uh, team uh, that have the background of ICT and some of the regional and the sub-regional, uh, those we call champions on how to do the local installation of the DHS2. So that, uh, because uh, we can't, and, and again, that uh, country have restriction, it's hard to, uh, for example, if you are being given uh, a visa to go to one uh, city, you are not allowed to go to another city. So you have to use those locals to train them, uh, the one that are allowed to go to another uh, another cities to do the installation. So those are the uh, methodology that you have been using. 
we collect them, train them how to do the DHS installation locally, and take uh, into consideration that most of them they're using Windows, so have to train them how to install them in the window, and also uh, have a good documentation on how they can replicate that installation procedure uh, to someone's also uh, desktop. But also uh, with the use of this WHO standardized metadata, because we find that you know uh, they are really disconnected, so they don't know what is happening outside. So sometimes you might find that uh, they will how uh, they want to collect data, they come up with a few variables and then uh, configuring them and they start collecting the data. But with the use of this WHO metadata package uh, that went with them and shared with them that uh, this is how you can be able to, uh, to use it. So we give them through uh, via flash so that uh, when they want like to use like a malaria dashboard or whatever, they can just easily be able to configure them to the national uh, national database. But uh, for example, this uh, kind of uh, uh, setup that we are doing, for example, here we are, we are configuring the uh, national database uh, within the Ministry of Health. Uh, so this was the big server that was being uh, funded by Global Fund. And then you have to uh, bring all the IT, show them how to uh, to install the DHS to national database. So the mode of collection of the data uh, is that uh, those local installation that has been done in pre, uh, in other area, so they'll be collecting data to their own uh, desktop, and then at the end of the month they have to transfer those data via flash, and then come to uh, to import them uh, uh, in, in 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 national. Uh, in national uh, database. And from there now, uh, the way how the setup of the national database, uh, they did it like uh, that local area network can be, uh, can serve like uh, the whole ministry. So even if the malaria want to access their data, they need to connect to that uh, network, which is a local area network, and be able to access the DHS too. And the HIV the same. So that's all the setup that uh, 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 is found there. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, we want to first uh, is like uh, we have this of uh, upgrading because the first time we went there, they were using uh, the DHS to which was the oldest one. So upgrading to the latest what was really uh, cumbersome because uh, it has some issues. You need to do some cleaning and things of that. But again, uh, and this is actually a still ongoing problem. Uh, problem. For example, they can't really upgrade like when the release is out. Because uh, once they face a challenge, it's hard to communicate with the outside expertise to help them. So they have to wait maybe until the end. Maybe we, we go there once a year, uh, according to the uh, uh, with the, the agreement that we have. So what we go there once of the year, so then we check if the, they still need to want to upgrade and then uh, we show them how to upgrade and then uh, we give them this all file because they can't download even the DHS2 all file, so you need to go with them uh, and then uh, give them, so for example, they can carry on to the other desktop uh, to, to upgrade the DHS2. So uh, this was one of the, I was showing them how to use the WHO uh, standard metadata package for the HIV tracker. And they really, for now, like they're interested to use the tracker. But you know the tracker is not easily as aggregate. And the, the problem is that uh, sometimes uh, it's hard to export a tracker and individual data from uh, someone's computer and then come to uh, to import to the national, uh, to the national. Uh, to the national data set, uh, to the national uh, database. So this uh, was one of the reasons that uh, we also reached to uh, Android developer because they are also eager to use the Android to be able to, uh, to capture data and to sync data offline. You see, so it was really, really hard and they tried and then, uh, but the way how they wanted it is like, uh, because they are capturing data maybe with the, uh, to the register, and once they come to the office, they want to use the Android uh, to capture those data and they sync to their to their desktop. So again, that was not working, and they were still uh, working together with the core team of the uh, of the world to see how uh, that can be can be solved. But they eagerly wanted to use the Android to see how they can 
facilitate capturing of the data uh, from the Android and then to the uh, to the to the to the national uh, database. But also another thing is uh, local training, as as we said, because uh, we have to take the few representative that are allowed to come uh, within uh, a smaller city. Um, that's of the capital city of the Eritrea, a smaller city, and they train them, and they have to give all the training package. They are fresh that they can carry that uh, training uh, to the other areas Zoba and the sub Zoba that it's hard for uh, for us to uh, to reach. So when we are, we are training, we are providing the whole package, starting with the installation, data correction, data analysis, everything, so that you can't because. You can find the one who is actually being trained for the, uh, maybe for the data capture might want to use maybe his or her laptop. So you need to also uh, train how to do the local installation to his computer so that he can, first, can make the easy uh, data collection uh, of the, uh, and then we send it to the national, uh, to the national database. So these are some of the challenges. Yeah, whenever they face a challenge, for example, listen to they sent, uh, because only they want to communicate it to us, and that's very interesting. When you go to this UN agency, they have these UN offices. That's where you can find an internet. So when they want to communicate with me, for example, there's analytics issue or something is not working, uh, they need to go to the UN offices. So and then they uh, drop it an, e an email, and then, you and then you can respond it, maybe next time they go there and then again. So it's a, a kind of slow process of communication because they are not always connected. Yeah, so it's hard to communicate whenever they face uh, some difficulties. So that's of, uh, one of the problem, but also uh, upgrading. So some of them, when you train them how to upgrade, they go and they try it. Whenever it fails, they keep using the, the old version. You see, so and then when you go there, they ask why, uh, why have you not upgraded? Say, okay, I tried and it failed, and it was hard to communicate back to, uh, back to you. But another problem that they have is uh, power instability. And for example, uh, they have a, okay, uh, they have a, 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 the previous server was actually had a. a Thoughts due to the power instability, and this was the new server that was donated by, uh, by, 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 by Global Fund. So because of that, you find even to the national level, to the Ministry of Health, they have that power instability. So whenever we are there and the power goes off, that will be the end of the day to work, and then you wait for uh, until you get uh, uh, when the power comes in. So that is the situation, but uh, I thank you very much. That's it I can be able to share with you, and that's what is happening in, in Eritrea. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Tuso. I think this is one of the most challenging setups that we could have. A lot of offline instances. We have time for one question, and I already saw one hand up there. So that's the only question. We... <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are running out of time, and there is still one more, one more use case. As Marta said before, uh, we want to, yeah. Uh, facilitate the networking. So from net 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., I think there are some space mm. for, so you can address all of them here. So yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Emily um, and I'm with MSF Amsterdam. And yeah, having challenges in connectivity is something that we are actually also facing. So I'm very interested to understand better where did you do the data collection? Was it using the desktop app? Or did you also use in the end the Android app? And how did you migrate data from one administrative level to then national level? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, can I go ahead? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, as I said, uh, they have this local installation of the DHS. So they're using the web. Android is not working there. Uh, they're using the web. So they are installed it DHS to a different computer. And then, for example, if you go to Subzoba, like a district kind of, uh, to the other country, uh, in the office of uh, HMIS, like those dealing with the data entrant, they have a, a desktop that is uh, connected to the LAN. LAN is a local area network. It's like they have wires yeah, connected to the desktop. And then they have this IP address. So just, for example, if you have, uh, uh, they have a laptop, they just need to connect to that Wi-Fi, 
that has no internet, it's Wi-Fi, but just like I can say an intranet. And then we put the IP address. Then they start capturing data. But since they are connected to the desktop, that data goes direct to the, uh, to the district uh, desktop. But the way how they transfer to the national database, they export it using the DHS to import export functionality. Okay, and that's for the aggregate. They export it, and then they send it to the uh, head of HMIS uh, of the National uh, uh, Ministry of Health. They send via flash, and then they, uh, that head of HMIS they have to import it to the to the national. Uh, to the national database. So that's the way how they are using it. Because they can't send even an email. So you have to export, put in the flash, and then, uh, and then send it to them, uh, to the national HMS. For the tracker that we have uh, piloted, you have piloted it for the uh, bigger uh, five hospital. But uh, we don't export a tracker. Yeah, yes, we don't export a tracker. We are using this uh, DHS2 data uh, exchange app, uh, DHS2 aggregate app converting them uh, to the aggregate and then they export aggregate and they send it to the national uh, to the national database, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so let's go with the fourth presentation. So it's Ibrahim Wikawa, is a senior de uh, software developer in the University, the University of Dar es Salaam. So uh, he's going to talk about the use case in Tanzania. So yeah, floor is yours. I think we can hear you, fine. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Ibrahim Wikama, of course a senior software developer from a university DHS2 lab. Yeah, so in our use case, basically we will showcase how we leverage the DHS2 platforms in strengthening um, community-based health systems in Tanzania, where our case basically, it will focus on uh, tuberculosis or TB mobile clinics vans, okay? Just a bit of an introduction. I do believe most of you are we are aware TB uh, remains a, a global public health challenge, particularly in uh, resource limited countries. Of course, in our case, for example, Tanzania. And we know due to Tanzania, it's a very big country. So we face issues in uh, TB case findings, especially most in uh, remote areas where it's hard to reach or there is no enough healthcare workers or laboratory facilities. Uh, and also associated the stigma with the seeking treatment. So due to this large country, whereas there is no enough uh, TB case findings, in 2021, as you can see, the Ministry of Health in Tanzania, especially the National Tuberculosis and Leprosy NTLP program uh, introduced the, the TB mobile clinic interventions. Of course, for now, there are five mobile vans for now, whereas these mobile vans are equipped with uh, laboratory facilities, for example, the X ray ones to extend the TB education. Also, the vans can do screening, can do also that diagnosis. Furthermore, they can even provide the treatment services to undeserved remote communities in all regions in Tanzania, okay? All this is just to increase the active case findings for TB. So about the TB mobile clinics, as we are aware, uh, most of the mobile vans, outreach interventions, they engage much in uh, rural or remote areas, you know, like it's not practical to deploy a mobile van in the city, where like there are a lot of plenty of uh, hospitals and health facilities. So basically they are targeting most the rural areas or the population, the remote populations using the vans, with, which are equipped with the TB diagnosis and treatment facilities. 
such as the services we pro, uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, the X-ray machines, the gene expert machines, etc. Uh, another thing, it's uh, for the presumptive ones, uh, the screened people who are taken for further lab for further lab or testing using the diagnostic facilities available in the vans who identified process. So, for example, in that process where you are identifying cases, you are screening your patients. For the ones who are presumptive, then these people, they are taken to further lab testing, as it is indicated there, they are taken to further lab testing use the diagnosis facilities in the van and once identified it as positive. Okay. So here is the simple workflow on how this mobile van operates. So it starts with the mobile van operators reaching out to the public audience. In that public audience where people will be screened, where they will undergo a normal standardized TB screening steps, okay? After this screening, it will identify the presumptive cases in which most of the patients, if you are found like it's a presumptive in the lab testing in fun, then this will extend now for those presumptive cases will be identified as TB patients, whereas those patients will start, uh, will be enrolled to further treatment inside the DHS2 national NTLP tracker workflow. Okay. So, where the problem is, uh, currently setting the mobile van implementation inside the country, basically they do use or they rely a lot in um, paper-based tools, in which ways they will go to the remote areas without any internet connectivities, etc. So all of this, they were being documented inside the papers, whereas they will later uh, fill the papers when they are uh, they are in the town where they have internet connections. Uh, another problem in the current setup where we have, there are a lot of difficulties in managing resources, such as the cartilage cost of fuels for the vans. And also there is uh, the accountability issues where like these cartridges tend to miss or they, like they disappear without clear what went wrong, okay? Yeah, so another thing, uh, due to remoteness uh, of areas, there is this lack of uh, timely progress tracking the data or the whatever cases that were being found in the remote areas for the national level to have access to this data, okay? Due to, as you can see, due to the uh, earlier problem, like a lot of stuff, they are being documented on the paper. So for the national level, it's kind of hard to, to request that information and to get it on time, okay? You have to make a lot of phone calls. Yeah. So this now came the TB Mobile Clinics app in which uh, the University of Laredo Salaam DHS2 Lab and the Ministry of Health, especially the NTLP part, the National Tuberculosis and Leprous Program, we collaborated together we look again into the workflow, how this process starts, screening, uh, identifying the presumptive cases until you're rolling them to the facility. Then uh, we had to now leverage whatever we have to improve and uh, make it the process efficient. That's when we used uh, the customizable DHS2 application that helped with uh, that the data entry process during data collection process. So here to just, uh, uh, I won't read everything, but it, it explains clearly, uh, we developed it or we used the DHS2 capture app, basically for capturing the aggregate data. Once uh, these healthcare workers, they are being deployed with the vans in the rural remote areas, where from which they do number of screening for TB patients, as well as resources used there for the gene expert cartilages. So we developed it or we catered around the 
business flow of data entry where we can capture all this from the patient data, like aggregate, and also filling in the gene expert cartilages, how many were used, how many were handed over to somebody, so as to uh, to solve the issue of accountability and the clear picture of uh, good use of the resources. Of course, the app was, uh, uh, the app was supposed to allow the mobile van operator to capture data in offline mode, then later send it to the central server, as uh, earlier what I elaborated. Offline functionality, as you can see, based on this setup, uh, off offline functionality was really necessary as the intervention involves mobile van that travels to various locations, including those without internet. Okay. So here in front uh, is the digitized workflow in which various uh, data sets were developed and customized. So to in, end, in order to cater for the offline mode, we also emphasize them to use the normal DHS2 capture in which it will equip them once they're in the rural remote areas, the tool or the mobile app can capture the data. Once they're in an area where there is connectivity, the data syncs to the national NTLP DHS2 instance. Okay. So after this, Interventions or after this working us in the Ministry of Health, finally now some interesting analysis started coming up. And also this was very good for the national team where they could have quick access to the information that earlier back then it was very hard. Like you have to make like 20 uh, multiple phone calls in order to get something like that. But now like everything was being synchronized in one system. So it was just click of buttons. You have your interesting analysis. So here there is analysis of uh, resource management. Just a simple uh, graph showing. Okay, so what are the achievements? So one of them, which was a customized dashboard, which will have a quick visualization of data flow and uh, decision making by stakeholders. And as you can see what I explained earlier, like initially you couldn't make this kind of uh, visualization because you don't have the data on your hand that quick. Uh, other one, it was for the healthcare professionals gain insight in uh, screen trendings, diagnosis outcomes and geographical patterns for TB prevalence and laboratory facility utilizations. As I said, uh, this workflow uh, opened the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Uh, address the loopholes, for example, for the missing cartridges, where now there were responsibilities, like how many cartridges you were handed over, how much of them are used, how many are left. So now that was very clear. So, yeah, uh, another thing we're utilizing the existing DHS2 platform. Uh, in facilitating the rapid implementation for the mobile van in alignment with WHO. The solution addresses complexities in TB resource control and settings and offering streamlined approach to data driven decision making. Okay. Opportunities. As you can see, what we developed, uh, the, we have a package where package of forms and dashboard for TB mobile van data management designed for adoption even by other countries if they will be having like similar implementation or interventions. So the package can be easily uh, adapted. Deployment of highlights, uh, trans transporting information uh, for digital, strengthening for community systems and developing countries like Tanzania. And also this opens up a door of integration of mobile, uh, mobile clinic app with the DHS2 patient based system and any other uh, interested system that would like to exchange data between the current system and the other one. Santeni San. Okay, thank you very much, Ibrahim. Yeah. Uh, it's almost time, but I think we have time for one quick question. Uh, 
in case you have. Okay, there is one question there. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Here, hello. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. This is Joseph from Malawi. So uh, I understand that uh, for this solution, we are focused on the aggregated level data and you have the plan to include the individual patient data. But uh, in the actual practice right now, how did this uh, individual level health record, medical record being captured? They are on paper or there's already some digital system? Thank you. Okay, thanks. For the current individual one, they first start from paper is a normal hospital flow, but eventually they do end it up to the national TB instance for patient level tracker information. Yeah. So they have the patient level system for that one. And you also use the DHS? Yes, DHS too, of course. <laughs> That's another topic. <laughs> 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 uh huh. Yes, another one. Okay. Okay. So I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But, uh, so yeah, it's actually time. Um, so these three presenters will be around. So if you have any questions, please reach them. So I think that's been a very yeah, insightful use cases, very different use cases, like a whole point of care, offline, offline systems, different solutions. So thank you all for the presentations. Uh, yeah, and that's all. <laughs>